All right, all right, all right. Welcome to part two of Suppressed History and Spiritual Warfare. My name is Austin, and this is Wanderer Broadcast. The first part we went into, really, what are the Jesuit order, what their mission is, and how they hide behind different religions, causing people to war against each other, while they sit back all fat and happy, and they're all giggling to each other at a certain level up there. And so, I would like to blow the lid off of it all with research I've done, and I'm about to start this part two off with a video by a Mr. Jeff Skuzin, Skuzin or Skousen, not really sure how to pronounce it, but this guy has had a forum up. He has a he has sort of a, a fringe political forum where he tells the truth about politics. And this video is pretty interesting where he basically brings it under a modern light. So I'm shifting into more modern times, bouncing around the timeline, trying to form a picture and hopefully opening the eyes and minds of the listeners so they'll go out and do their own research and see how flippin' crazy this all is. Enjoy. As, as Tom said, I'm the uh, editor and publisher of the World Affairs Brief. It's a weekly news analysis service that concentrates on helping you understand what the globalist agenda is in domestic and foreign policy in the United States. The government will, of course, claim that they're <clears throat> doing everything in the interest of the nation and the interest of the taxpayer, but they're not. Ever since, I think, Ronald Reagan was the last president we had that was not a controlled uh, puppet. Eisenhower was, Kennedy was, uh, Nixon was, Ford was, um, and, of course, George W. Bush was, and, and uh, Barack Obama. A lot of you who have been exposed to the conservative, the quote, mainstream conservative network like Fox News will get a lot of information about Barack Obama, negative information. And one of the most prominent concepts is that he's a Marxist and he's a Muslim. It's not true. He used to be a Marxist. He never was a Muslim and never was a Christian. He's simply gone to those various religions and uh, when it suits political purposes, but he's an a-religious person, has no religious beliefs whatsoever. Uh, and he sold out long ago to the globalists. And that's why Barack Obama is a puppet to them. He's got more skeletons in his closet than, um, I don't know what to compare it with, but he's got a lot. Uh, Barack Obama's a homosexual. It's a sham marriage he has. Uh, Barack Obama has, uh, is an illegal alien. In fact, uh, his father, uh, Obama, probably wasn't his father. It was probably a sham marriage as well to cover up for his real father, Mr. Marshall, a Marxist activist. And his mother was having a pornographic relationship with Marshall in his home in Hawaii. And uh, yeah, they got together... Uh, <clears throat> Hussein Obama to marry her to cover up for the pregnancy that was, and if you look at the pictures between of, uh, of Mr. Marshall and Obama, you see a very distinct relationship <clears throat> that you don't see it with his father from Kenya. Um, but nevertheless, he holds, uh, he's, has an illegal alien status, he holds a false social security card, which was provided to him by the government, and so they got a lot to twist his arm with. He worked for the CIA while he was at Occidental University, and that's why no one knew him there. He did have a roommate who occasionally saw him when he wasn't uh, out of the country doing special assignments for the CIA. So once you go down that road, you know, like Hillary Clinton, they make you wealthy. How is it that a person like Barack Obama, who has never earned more than $60,000 a year as a community organizer, is worth over $20 million today? You know, it's the $100,000 stock deals that Hillary Clinton got and when she was part of the Rose Law Firm. This is the way that they handle insiders, not Marxists. They handle people who convert and come over to globalism and do their bidding. So America will not be solved by getting rid of Barack Obama. 
I'm here to tell you that the establishment has been trying to give you a controlled Republican as the next president to undo the fervor that you have against Obama and against the Democratic administration. They know that you'll go down and go to sleep if they give you a Republican like George W. Bush. But unfortunately, and this is one of the four or five areas in which the globalists have, are meeting tremendous resistance today. They've had a free ride all the way up through George W. Bush. But the globalists have met severe resistance in five major areas. Politics, which I'll talk about first. Uh, the EU and their globalist uh, free trade agreements, tremendous amount of resistance. Immigration, tremendous amount of resistance. Gun control, tremendous amount of resistance. Despite all of their efforts to manipulate things like what just happened in California. And I'll cover the manipulative evidence that will show you that this was a government operation as, was, as have been almost all of the mass shootings that we have to deal with today. But let's first talk, talk about politics. I predicted in the World Affairs Brief long ago that they would not really want Hillary Clinton to be president. I mean, she looks like a slam dunk, but she's not. Hillary Clinton has a very difficult time being popular even with the Democrats. And that's why Bernie Sanders is so, uh, you know, the hardcore Democrats really want a hardcore socialist. Hillary Clinton is, uh, you know, a globalist puppet. And so she'll bend with the waves, and so she doesn't really have a good, strong reputation, even with the hardcore Democrats. But the powers that be know that Hillary Clinton will actually try to run the White House if she gets in. She is a real dominant woman. And she's got a lot of skeletons in her closets as well. But they really want a compliant puppet. They'd just as soon have Barack Obama watching his sports shows on television until they call him to read his script, and that's why he needs a teleprompter so often. But planning in the political realm. Um, let's talk a little bit about free trade agreements and the EU. There's a massive backlash in the EU against big government control. The UK Independent Party in Britain is winning elections. They've won over 40% of the delegates to the EU uh, Parliament. The French uh, Party of Marie Le Pen, um, the National Front has won the majority of delegates to the European Parliament. So you see, the, the globalists are really worried. There's a backlash against this, and that backlash has increased with this immigration problem. You see, part of the globalist purposes in creating all this mess in Syria was to create a flow of refugees that would flood Europe and water down the culture and make sure that Europe is never again like it was before, a predominantly white Christian nation. And that's the same thing that's happening here in the United States. And this agenda about immigration, illegal immigration and refugees has everything to do with making sure that conservatives in any of these countries never have the ability to win an election again. again. Now, in the 2012 election, I believe, uh, and they showed that the, the Democrats actually had a majority, but I don't think they were correct. I think that they made eight to 10 million votes, eight to 10 million votes disappear in 2012 in order to defeat Romney. And the reason I know that is because they said, according to the federal election data, that eight million people less voted in 2012 than 2008. Now, ask yourself the question, was there more enthusiasm or less enthusiasm in 2012 about getting rid of Obama? Was there more enthusiasm about Romney than McCain in 2012? Of course there was, a lot more enthusiasm. So, if they say that 8 million less people voted, it can't mean that 8 million less people voted. It means they made that many votes disappear, at least that many votes disappear in order to defeat him. And remember, 2012 was the first year that all the state votes were tallied at the federal level. And so when they came out with a national tally, you had no way of knowing where those 8 million votes went away because they were tallied at the federal level. It was a very slick proposition. But you can't get away with that too many times before people start to, to get on. And that's why they want to give you a Republican so that you won't contest what's coming on this next time. 
But in terms of immigration, a lot of people keep saying, you know, well, and you have a lot of conservative websites like World Net Daily, who's got this, you know, they, they're, let me put it this way, the globalists have hyped the anti-Muslim agenda, not because Muslims aren't a problem, they are a problem. But they're not a threat to the world, they're not a threat to the United States. The Muslims, except for Iran, don't have any weapon systems of their own. You can't conquer the world when you don't make any of your own weapons. It's just like Iran. They got F-14s from the United States during the Shah. And once the Ayatollah came in and, this, and the U.S. said, cut the parts supply, those F-14s weren't flying a month later. And Iran learned its lesson. That's why the globalists have tried to take down Iran. You know, they give North Korea a free ride. No sanctions on North Korea. Nothing's happened. No military option on the table. No regime change required. It's the most tyrannical regime in all the world. So it's a living prison camp. Iran, a fairly civilized nation, we've got on the chopping block constantly since 2006. Three aircraft carrier groups off of Iran threatening them with destruction. Why? Because Iran's the only Muslim country that's threatening to develop all of their own indigenous weapon systems. Missiles, rockets, tanks, airplanes, drones. They've got all that stuff in production. That's why the sanctions, that's why you've got to cut off Iran. And so why Syria? Why is Syria under the target? Because Israel was assigned as early as 2004 to take out Iran, or at least to start the war with Iran. The theory was you target Iran's nuclear program, they will retaliate against Israel and against all the American troops in the air. That will give us, the United States, an excuse to blast Iran to smithereens. We don't intend to occupy Iran, just destroy all of their military and civilian infrastructure, bring them to the dark ages, and then they'll be out of the picture. And that's what the U.S. was planning. But Israel says, look, we've got Syria right on our border, and Syria has thousands of Scud missiles with chemical weapons. They send a volley over towards Tel Aviv, and our Iron Dome can't possibly shoot down that many missiles. So you take Syria out, or we won't attack Iran. And so three years ago, the United States was ready to take out Syria. Remember that no-fly zone? It wasn't a no-fly zone. It's like Libya's no-fly zone. Got cruise missiles coming in all the time. That's not a no-fly zone. That's a, an excuse, a cover for an illicit attack operation. We had special forces in there. We had tomahawks. We had all kinds of... Uh, in fact, we blasted the city of Sirta with 20,000 inhabitants, killed almost everyone. And, and we're talking about Russian casualties? In Syria, come on, you know, we are the greatest hypocrite in the world in terms of civilian casualty. We did all that in Libya. And what's Libya today? It's a basket case full of armed jihadists, total civil war, and we created it. We're responsible for that, all in the name of what? Democracy? And um, so we had this three years ago, this no fly zone set up, and of course, it, the, the media knew exactly what the U.S. was up to. And so John Kerry steps before the London press conference and says, starts talking about how we've got to, Assad's got to step down and we're going to, you know, take him out. And a reporter says, you know, it's very obvious to us that you're going to do an invasion and, uh, you know, with air power in Syria. Is there anything that Assad can do to stop this? Is there anything that he can do? And Kerry just off the top of his head, oh, yeah, they could give up their chemical weapons and we wouldn't have attack. And the next day, Syria says, we accept. <laughs> and um, Kerry got the biggest tongue lashing of his life when he stepped off that stage. This clip goes on for a little longer. I want to say like 30 minutes. And it, I just find it really interesting because it's not as much um, focusing on the term Jesuit, but this, this guy focuses on the term globalist, which I would say is a parallel name, like a synonym, you know, the, all these terms are, we, we get lost in the terms and the specific names, but they change over time. Different cultures and civilizations call different people, different things. So the intentions and motivations I feel are what's important behind these evil groups. And Jeffrey screws in there. Um, mentions how we do all these little things as a military we will politically interfere with one country and so they will retaliate against this other country will which will 
eventually force us to get involved and have the American public in on it and supportive of it, hence 9-11. And obviously that's one of the more controversial and widely known conspiracies where this patriotism from 9-11 and this anti-terrorism movement goes, kicks off. It, it works out beautifully for the Bushes and all of these fat, stupid, pe power-hungry reptiles because we're all pumped up, ready to go to war, send our kids off to war, fight for what we think is retribution. But we're just fighting these people's wars for them. We're, we're the monopoly pieces for these, these people. And... So this uh, w one thing I did disagree with and what I've heard differently is he said Ronald Reagan was the last president that wasn't a globalist puppet, which I've heard the exact opposite where Reagan was actually the, the first non-Catholic um, president who was able to further such a Roman Catholic Jesuit agenda that they wouldn't have hoped any better out of kennedy which um he was roman catholic jfk and decided to speak out against the secret societies and the jesuits which is why he got yapped in in the link in the limo but um that's that's the only thing i kind of disagree with i don't know where he gets his information i know he did go to um brigham i think brigham university and i looked into the college and it is a catholic school so i don't know how much this guy has been indoctrinated a certain way but he is saying things that are very true and are very not mainstream and it's interesting to hear that perspective and now we're gonna go into another video relating to the hollywood jesuit infiltration where we think it's all these zionist jews who run hollywood which they do, but who put them there? Who really is behind that? So we can just think it's the Jews and have them like live, fulfill their roles of, you know, whatever stereotypes might fall in. But I, that's all apparently by design as well. Call no man your father upon earth. Here it for is. There is one God which is in heaven. Okay. Um, now, Jesus was not talking in a biological sense. He was talking about in a religious sense. And there's a couple of religions which will remain nameless. They do this all the time. Um, yeah, and the Roman Catholic religion, thats they base everything on that just about. The Pope is the but, Holy Father. But, <laughs> yes. Yeah, and every priest is called Father. Father, forgive me for I have sinned. Yeah, totally in contradiction to the scripture. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, there's an old joke that since they... Okay, this is a complete urban legend. Uh, that tradition uh, supposedly started back in the Middle Ages when they sired so many illegitimate children just to cover themselves. They would call, everybody would call the priest father. Well, no doubt they produce hundreds of thousands of illegitimate children. Many of them were killed in the convents. Others grew up to be, you know, they had no legitimate fathers. They were considered bastards. They had no title. And it was all the working of the priests because they felt that they had the right to help themselves to the women whenever they wanted to. And the nuns, they told the nuns that their semen was the was the Holy Spirit, if you listen to the testimony of Sister Charlotte. Over the weekend, author Anne Rice died. Uh, she, grew, she died. Now, Dole, Bob Dole was 98 and Anne Rice was 80 years old. She died in New Orleans. And she was probably best known for her Vampire Diary, diary series. And at least two of her works were uh, made into feature length films. You're talking about the 1994 interview with a vampire starring Tom Cruise and Brad Pitt. Oh, wonderful. And then um, two you, wonderful Jesuit coadjutors. Uh, okay. Yes. Now, you have uh, Roman Catholic Tom Cruise, Corey, one of my cousins. Is uh, I beg your pardon. According to one of my sources, he's a cousin. Uh, he and uh, Fidel Castro were cousins. Really, Tom Cruise was a cousin to Fidel Castro. A, a distant cousin. Distant cousin. Well, mm -hmm. But the the Castro fa family, they're not ethnic Cubans. They're Italians, and they're from old Italian no nobility. Okay, that's right. 
old Italian nobility. Mm -hmm. And of course, he went. To, now, I know I've said this before, so forgive me for repeating myself. Uh, Fidel and his brother Raul both uh, went to three different Jesuitical schools. Now, according to um, <laughs> I'm drawing a blank here. I'm just going. Well, he to went to the University of Berlin in Havana for seven years, and he was known as the Greaseball. And I have that in a book on Fidel Castro. He was uh, quite the guy. So no, they, they 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 raised up this scumball to be the dictator of Cuba, another serial adulterer and fornicator, like LBJ, and. Um, and when they have that, they have a complete and total uh, willing instrument. Of course, he sets up the Inquisition there in Cuba with his police state and all of his prisons that he has. But Fidel Castro was a horrible, terrible man. And I have a Cuban friend living in Austin, Texas, and his family, his parents managed to escape. And he came out as a little boy and he told me everything that Castro did. And he also hated the blacks. His right hand man, Che Rivera, said, well, what are you going to do for the blacks after the revolution? He said exactly what they've done for it. Absolutely nothing. Che Rivera hated the blacks. So these guys are working for the white power structure and they're killers and wicked men. And Fidel Castro did his damage. He was also an operative of the CIA too. Alan Dulles put him in power. But go well, ahead, George. Well, Alan Dulles actually put, uh, installed Castro in his organization at the behest of Reinhard Galen. Uh, this is according to Galen's biography. Um, now, oh, really? What's what's the yeah. name of Reinhard Galen's biography? I believe the biography of Reinhard Galen. I mean, I, uh, I, I this is according to one of my Canadian sources. But um, it, anyhow, uh, Galen had an audience w with both Dulles's, uh, Alan and John Foster. Uh, he had an audience with Harry Truman and Dwight Eisenhower. As a matter of fact. Well, Reinhard Galen, you know, as you know, he was a knight of Malta, so was his brother. Mm -hmm. And it's Reinhard Galen that betrays the German troops in the east and secures their defeat. And then he is also going to come to the U.S. with a secret treaty of Fort Hood in Virginia in 1945. They're going to extend this new intelligence community into Germany called the Gellenorg and later the BND. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, Reinhard Galen worked with the Dulles brothers, and he's even portrayed in the movie JFK when he's talking to to J, to LBJ. We've got to get them into, into, into Saigon. The guy with the German accent is Reinhard Galen. Well, and of course, this is um, in the biography of, of William Donovan. Uh, Donovan flew um, Galen out of Germany on his personal plane. Now, he was not secreted out of Europe through the rat lines or through the Operation Paperclip. He made no attempt whatsoever to dissemble his identity. He remained Reinhard Galen the, the remainder of his life. He didn't dye his hair or get in plastic surgery or anything like that. Yeah, makes perfect sense. While Bill Donham was a fanatical Irish Catholic, he was an Ida Malta, he was head of the OSS, a right hand man of Dirty Harry Truman, who was a 33rd degree Freemason. And so they brought out their Brother Freemason Reinhard Galen, who had secured an Allied victory by his treason to his own German people. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay, if I can just, well, just getting back to the whole vampire thing, and I, I just had a question for you. And I know you're not supposed to, I'm, I probably shouldn't do this, but. Uh, well, don't ask me if I'm a vampire, George. <laughs> <laughs> well, that reminds me, what is the Jesuits' obsession with not just vampires, but cannibalistic zombies, ghouls? Because if you look at it, I mean, probably the first, one of the, in terms of say the uh, talking era, the first talking vampire, if you will, was a, Bel was a Roman Catholic, Bella Lugosi. Yep. Uh, another Italian, one, Italian Roman Catholic, Bella Lugosi. Okay. Yes. Because the and notable it, Catholics in this country are Italians and Irish. They're the most abject slaves of the Jesuit order. Okay, I just wanted to hop in here while we're talking about the Italians that Nancy Pelosi, look how relevant she is these days, along with Radatoni Fauci, who I mentioned in the last video and went a little deeper into, but I'm about to tie this knot off right now. Um, Nancy Pelosi, Nancy Pelosi, her father, Thomas D'Alessandro, 
her maiden name is D'Alessandro. Uh, he was a Baltimore, Maryland, U.S. representative from 1939 to 1947. Calvert Catholic Business College ran for ran for governor of Maryland in 1945, but dropped out after accused of receiving under the table money from Dominic Paracci, who was a parking garage owner and convicted of fraud and conspiracy to obstruct justice. So that's where Pelosi comes from. She also went to the Institute of Notre Dame, which is a Catholic high school. She went to Trinity College, which is an all-girls Catholic college, and Fauci. And just to finish things up with Fauci, he went to Regis High School, which is a private Jesuit school. His father, Stephen Fauci, was a pharmacist and went to Columbia University in New York City, which was established in 19, or 1754 as King's College on the grounds of Trinity Church, which is in relation to Trinity College, which is the all-girls Catholic college I was mentioning Pelosi went to. And it's all kind of just one big web here. His maternal grandparents are from Naples. His paternal grandparents are from southeast Sicily. And one of his biggest quotes regarding his career, Fau Anthony Fauci, is here. My career and my identity has really been defined by HIV. Fauci on The Guardian in 2020 interview. Huh. So this guy made his career off of the HIV, AIDS, labeling, scare tactics, and everything that went behind that. He probably was groomed for the role, told what to say, told what to do, and they'll be like, Anthony, everything is going to be fine. Don't worry. Go ahead. Okay, so there's a famous line in... Uh... Uh, Dracula, the 1931 film, where, where he's talking to some people and he says, I never drink wine, that is. Uh, but of course, another famous actor to portray um, uh, Dracula was Christopher Lee, Sir Christopher Lee, who was a knight of St. John of Jerusalem. Yep. C-H-R-O-S-T-P-H-E, or Christopher Lee. He's a knight of, knight of Malta. He's a knight of St. John of Jerusalem. Yeah. And a darling of the Jesuits in their movies. Well, yes. I mean, he made a name for himself with Hammer films in the 1950s and 60s, uh, usually playing against uh, Christopher, I'm sorry, Peter Cushing. Uh, usually, uh, Lee would play Dracula, and Lee would play his uh, nemesis, Dr. Abraham Van Helsick. Now, the, even though Van Helsing is fictitious, he's a devout Roman Catholic. Mm, I see. And who was Van Helsing? Usually Peter uh, Cushing. Oh, he played the part of Van Helsing. Is that what you're yes. saying? I see. Well, you know, Christopher <laughs> Lee was also in the Jedi movies, too. Uh, the, yes, he the was. Star Wars movie. Mm -hmm. Now, he was also a uh, royal. Oh, Christopher Lee was in two different services, 1939, 1940. He was in the Finnish army. Now, I've said this before. Lee's dates were 1922 to 2015. His birthday was the 26th of May. I forgot when he actually died. But um, so he was involved um, with MI6. Now, this is something, we, this may sound trivial, but between 19, late 1939 and early 1940, you had called something called the Winter War between Russia and Finland. That's correct. And so some, known as a winter war. Mm -hmm. they, uh, they I wish they would have given it a more creative name, but that's the best they could do. But uh, anyhow, so something like a million Russians died in this conflict. Yeah, the Finns smashed them. And I, you, I can only conclude that because of the military maneuvers of the Russians, run by the Bolsheviks, that there was a deliberate kill-off of the Russian manhood. They wanted that to happen. Mm-hmm. And so you know, something I've mentioned to you before, but you know, when looking at what is commonly called uh, the final phase of the Second Thirty Years' War, World War II, roughly 1939 and 1945. Now, people, there's some disputes as to what those actual dates are, but th those are the figures most people go with, or rather the years most people go with. Um, 
you had to look at all these operations and side shows and you're saying how many of them were actually necessary how many of them actually served any sort of strategic or military value and with well, the number of them you had to scratch your head or at least i do uh, <laughs> if you start- i devoted 150 pages in my book vatican assassins to the second 30 years war and most of those pages have to do with the treason the the conspiracy between the allies and the axis working together at the top and it you know it would be a great work for somebody who's a real historian that has time to dig out all that stuff it'd be a very large volume just from 1914 to 1945 of all the treason and collusion between the axis and the allied powers subject to the pope and the people that were killed and how that furthered the council of trent and the killing off of heretics and liberals well, yeah, I, I actually have a couple of historians of mine. I'll, I'll definitely volunteer Harrison Katz for that one. I would too. He's just wonderful, and and I'm getting all sorts of good reports about him. Yeah. Well, talking about vampires, uh, zombies, and so forth, there are a couple of films that were, came out in the 1960s. One was not particularly popular. It was the 1964 movie with Vincent Price called The Last Man on Earth. Vincent Price later converted to, he was a, grew up Episcopalian, but he actually converted to Catholicism. Well, that's the only sane thing to do when you're Episcopalian. I mean, but, yeah. it's really Roman Catholicism. So just instead of calling yourself a Catholic, just go back to the Catholic Church and be what Episcopalians are in general, just Roman Catholics with another title. Some of the greatest oh, well, traitors we've ever had have been Episcopalians, like uh, Longstreet, Longstreet and Lee and these other centers, Grant. All Episcopalian Roman Catholics, traitors the to the people. The Bushes. Bushes. Oh, really? Was he Episcopalian? Well, Daddy, I mean, Daddy Bush. Well, the, the Bush family, for the most part, were Episcopalian. W became a Methodist when he married his wife Laura. Jeb or John Ellis became a Roman Catholic and a Knight of Columbus. Amen. That's right. I think he's fourth degree. So in any event, all these apostate Protestants are just crypto Catholics anyway, and I, I admire them when they just finally say, well, we're going to go back to the Catholic Church because that's what we are anyway. That's the honest thing they're doing. Either do they do that or become atheists because the two choices for all these apostate Protestants is atheism or Catholicism. My grandparents, my grandparents felt they were, they were Anglicans. And what did they turn into? Good communists, card-carrying communists in the 1930s. So that's the fruit of Bible denying, Christ denying, apostate Protestantism. Well, I would say amen. But, but the, well, you uh, should. It's the truth. It's well, absolutely the truth. Too bad it's my grandparents, but that's just the way it is. It's the truth, uh, the truth is the truth. Yeah. Well, yes, amen. And, you know, we're talking about treason and uh, deception and mass murder and cover ups. We talked about Christopher Lee. So, as I said, he served in the Finnish army. Now, he, he was, um, as I said, a British subject. So why would be fighting for Finland? Yeah, and he's MI6, too. Mm-hmm. And you think there's a connection between British intelligence and Finnish intelligence? Remembering that the British helped put Lenin in power in 1917, 1918, yeah, with the trust. Yeah, there's a good book you can read on this. It's called The Fabian Socialist, uh, Fabian Freeway by Roselle Martin. She shows you that the British Fabian Socialists helped to install the Bolsheviks with the Bolshevik Revolution, and they could go in and out of Bolshevik Russia anytime they wanted to. Sydney and Beatrice Webb and all those other centers. So British intelligence helped set up the Bolsheviks, and so now they're going to work with the Finns to kill off Russian manhood because the Russian manhood was orthodox, and they couldn't stand the papacy. So you got to get rid of those people. Okay, so as I said, there's the film from 1964, The Last Man on Earth, which was the first film adaptation of I Am Legend, which is a a Richard Matheson novel that came out in 1954. Now, there are two other adaptations of this novel, the 1971 Charleston Heston, Omega Man, and the 2007 Will Smith, I Am Legend. Um, So anyhow, now... Last Man on Earth film in 1964 served as a progenitor to the zombie genre, the first or the cannibalistic zombie genre. The first actual cannibalistic zombie film was the 1967 George Romero movie Night of the Living Dead, 
George Romero being a devout Roman Catholic. Makes sense. George, George Romero and the Night of the Living Dead. I remember that movie. We thought it was hilarious. It was so crazy. But yeah, Night of the Living Dead with George Romero, a Roman Catholic. Uh, now, speaking of movie and uh, predictive programming and propaganda, uh, I just uh, a couple weeks ago, I finished Sean Wilcox's Jesuit Hollywood. 2015. And for those who have not read it, I would recommend it. And if you've read it before, I would recommend you read it again. And to me, I would put it almost in the same league as Vatican Assassins. Yeah, Sean is a great author. I know him. He's a Canadian. I have his other work on the Lincoln assassination. And so he is very, very good with those details. And any book he writes, I'll recommend it. Okay, because uh, it, so he talked about several films uh, from the and back. then, and by the way, the name of the book is Jesuit Hollywood. Yes. Wonderful. Okay, you can get it online, I believe, in a PDF form, uh, or you, I suppose you can go somewhere and get it in the uh, Agile print form. But anyhow, one of the films he talked about was the 1944 movie, uh, The Fighting Sullivans, which was actually based on a true story. It was about five uh, brothers named Sullivan. Uh, who died on the USS Juno, uh, which partook, which participated in the Guadalcanal campaign in November 1942. Now, I had heard of the Sullivan brothers, but I had never heard of the USS Juno. I mean, I, I knew they served on some ship somewhere. Uh, on the night of November the 13th, 1942, uh, the Juno, which had a complement of roughly 700 men, was according to the official story, hit, hit by two uh, torpedoes from a Japanese sub and hit the magazine and blew it up instantly. Now, as I said, she had a complement of 700 men, but only 10 of whom survived. Therefore, the Sullivan brothers were uh, among the victims. So, And we learned from this that the Jesuits in control of the Japanese Navy and the American Navy together will sacrifice their own Roman Catholic people to further their ends. So just because you're Roman Catholics, friends, don't think that the papacy is on your side. They have no allegiance to you whatsoever, and they'll sacrifice you whenever they deem it necessary because it's a military operation. Jesuits are a military order. And that's the end of part two, folks. I'm trying to keep it a little shorter so it's more digestible and tolerable. With the uh, pandemic of boredom going around, you know, we can't sit through things without a bunch of bright lights and flashing and pictures. So I'm trying to make it as digestible and entertaining as possible. At the same time, keep it informative and throw these, these boys under the proverbial bus that they deserve to be thrown under. And part three coming soon.